Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Sharon Bischoff, uh, the North Carolina State Parks uh, Mountain Region Biologist. Hey, everybody. Uh, thanks for bearing with me. I'm in a very different location. I was, as I was laughing with Jen and Laurel, I was five minutes away from uh, doing this presentation from my car. So I managed to find a spot with power and internet and we're ready to roll. <laughs> well, um, as Thomas said, I'm Sharon Bischoff. I'm the mountain region biologist with North Carolina State Parks. And a shout out to all my mountain folk. I hope that you uh, are faring well and, and in a safe spot and didn't suffer too much damage in the last 24 hours. Um, it's been an interesting, interesting go. So I'm gonna kind of try and roll us through as quickly as I can a, a millennia of land use change across the mountains of North Carolina and with emphasis on our, our fire history and how that has impacted our landscape. And I'm really gonna try and do it in under 30 minutes. So keep that in mind that I'm gonna kind of skip over a lot of details and really just kind of pull out some high points that drastically altered our, our land use changes and, and landscape. Um, but there's a lot more to the story than what I'm gonna give you in this 25, 30 minutes. So when we talk about Western North Carolina, we're looking at, is it not gonna, there we go. Okay, Ooh. so when we're talking about Western North Carolina and we say often the mountains of North Carolina, what we're really looking at is the Southern end of the ancient Appalachian mountains, um, which contain the majority of the highest elevations really in Eastern America. And that's a really important point to remember because that elevation gradient in such a small region in addition to the rugged topography and climate really drives the high biodiversity of this region. And we have, uh, the Southern Alps are recognized globally as a biodiversity hotspot for temperate forests. We have just, and that's based on a high number of species richness, uh, abundance, as well as a really high number of endemic species that occur in this region all because of that elevation gradient, the rugged terrain that, that isolates populations for millions of years so that there's genetic diversification into and leading to that endemism. And so why am I bringing all this up in a fire talk? Well, I want us to remember just the ecological significance of this region. Um, because if we want to manage this area responsibly and effectively, we really need to understand the importance of it. So what is uh, what are these mountains mainly composed of? Well, mostly hardwood forests, predominantly oaks with pine oak systems as well. And so I want us to, if you are a, <clears throat> excuse me, if you're a student of fire ecology, then when you hear the words pine and oak, you're going to, your ears are gonna perk up right away and you're gonna go, hmm, those are fire adapted species. With fire exclusion, they start to kind of blink out. And so I want you guys to look at this map that I've pulled from Adam Warwick's uh, most recent publication, the Fire Manager's Guide for the Southern Blue Ridge Ecozones. And if you don't have a copy of this resource, uh, I highly recommend it. You need to get your hands on a copy. It's, it's just extremely well done. So if we look at this map, what it's uh, modeling for us is the predicted vegetation patterns across the whole landscape based on just a whole host of interrelated factors, including the elevation, uh, uh, solar exposure, the soil moisture and chemistry type aspect, it's really taking into account a lot and trying to predict for us what these vegetation types would be on the ground. So at a quick glance, uh, I think that first that pops out is the purples and the blues those high elevation, uh, cool, wet sites like our spruce fir forests, our northern hardwoods, and some of our cove forests, they, they kind of stand out. But if you take a second and really look at the whole landscape, you'll see that the majority is the oranges, the reds, the yellows, and those are our pines and oak forests. And we said those are fire adapted systems. And so that tells us that these mountains were built to burn. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
Now, it's not a one size fits all, right? It's a mosaic. Just kidding. But it is a mosaic. <laughs> Sorry, you have to put up with my cheesy humor. So not only is it a mosaic in terms of what the vegetation patterns, uh, how they occur across the landscape, but it also is a mosaic in the correlating fire behavior, fire frequency, and fire effects on the landscape. And that's really important to try to understand, but the, the deeper you dig into those details, um, the quicker you realize it gets complicated pretty quickly. And so I don't want us to get buried in those nuances and variability. If you're a land manager or fire practitioner, you need to understand those for your site. But for this talk, I don't want us to get lost in those details. Um, I just want us to understand that these mountains burned repeatedly with variability. And so let's take a closer look at those six ecozones um, that Adam Warwick elevated. So if we look at the species composition, um, the nomenclature is based off of the tree species, the dominant tree species, but the bulk of the species in those systems are in the understory. They're the grasses, the forbs, the vines, the ferns, anywhere from 60 to almost 80% of the composition are those fine fuels that dry out quickly and are in the understory. And so that is, should already, again, if you are a fire ecology student, your ears should perk up and you go, hmm, that's telling me that there were gaps in the canopy and there was a fair amount of sunlight getting to the forest floor in these systems. So if we think about forests that way and not of what their current states are, it's a little bit easier to understand and, and comprehend that the role of lightning really is a realistic option for ignition sources in the mountains. And do we know, does lightning provide enough ignition source to maintain our fire adapted pine and oak systems in the mountains? Or is that an artifact of anthropogenic land use change and, and their use of fire? It's a really hard question. And there's a lot of debate about it. And I honestly, I don't think we have enough information. We need to do more research to really try and tease that out. But for, for right now, we understand that these forests had open canopies, had a lot of sunlight hitting the forest floor and the biodiversity in the understory was much higher than, than current day. So how did we end up with sites that look like this? Spoiler alert, it's a lack of disturbance. <laughs> Hopefully that doesn't come as too much of a surprise, but we, we're gonna look now at what those anthropogenic changes were through history that may have led to us inheriting landscapes that look like this. So when we start to think about the first people that arrived in North Carolina, we, uh, it's roughly around 14,000 BCE um, up into 1000 BCE. That's the Paleo-Indian and Archaic peoples. They were primarily nomadic uh, hunter and gatherer uh, civilizations. We don't have a tremendous amount of information about them. However, we do know a lot more about the Woodland era people who that era was between 1000 BCE and 1100 CE. And so we know that these civilizations started to develop more semi-permanent uh, villages and they're characterized especially for their agricultural use. And we know that they used fire to clear the land not only for their village sites, but also for their agricultural sites. And they also used fire to help maintain forests that promoted oaks and chestnuts in the mountain region, and those are all game species that they were pursuing. <clears throat> we also know that um, roughly around 1000 CE up until the historic era in 1700, we start to see the Mississippian culture arrive in North Carolina. And their use of fire is very similar but these civilizations are even more well-established, larger permanent settlements with 
really large urban centers, trade centers, um, as well as stratified um, social class systems with priests and chiefs. And so I just want us to remember that we've gone through thousands of years of large civilizations across the country and across North Carolina. These civilizations used fire in many different ways through their, through their lives and impacted and influenced the, their landscape. So if we look in the early 1700s, this gives us an idea of the tribes that were present in North Carolina. And if we're looking at Western North Carolina, of course, we know that that is the Cherokee Nation. Not only were they throughout the mountains of North Carolina, but they were across Tennessee into Georgia and South Carolina as well. So who were the first Europeans to encounter the, the Cherokee as well as uh, the Southern Appalachians? Well, the first European recorded is Hernando de Soto from the 1500s, but he was more interested in conquering and searching for gold. So that's all I'm gonna say about him. William Bartram is uh, the more uh, well-known naturalist who traveled all across the Southeast and included um, a journey through the Southern Alps in what is present day, uh, the Nanahala area, <clears throat> excuse me. And so he, his focus was, like I said, and he was a naturalist. So his desire was to explore the natural world, identify and describe the flora and fauna he encountered on these journeys and document it. And so some of the things that he denoted in the Southern App region was he, uh, um, brought up that there were open glades, open grassy woodlands throughout the mountains in his journey, as well as rhododendron thickets along streams and waterfall corridors. So that gives us an idea of kind of the, again, that mosaic across the mountains. And in the mid 1700s, this map gives us an idea of the extent of European immigrant settlement across the state. And so, the bulk of the Scotch, Irish, German, and English immigrants came from the Northeast across the Great Wagon Road through Virginia, landing in west, the Western Piedmont and then progressing farther west into the mountains. And so those, those types of settlements, again, because of that rugged terrain in the mountains, really uh, inhibited our uh, travel and really, development of the region. So for the most part, their settlements were those small scale subsistence farms um, and they used fire as well to clear the land for their homesteads, for their agricultural sites, as well as to promote pasture land for their livestock, but it was still maintained at a small scale. And unfortunately in the late 1830s is when the US government sanctioned and forcibly removed the majority of the Cherokee people from their land in the mountains of North Carolina and Tennessee and forced them to walk to the Oklahoma Territory. And I bring that up because that is a big change in the impact to the landscape of our mountains. Those people were forced to leave primarily for allowing more space for the growing European population to settle into the mountains farther with these small scale subsistence farming. And it's in this era that we start to see that Appalachian woods burning culture start to establish and it persists through the mountains up through roughly the 1940s. Now I can hear and I can even see my boss, John Blanchard uh, sitting here and I can hear his voice in the back of my head going, well, that's really good anecdotal information, Sharon, but show me the data. So let's talk about some of the data. <laughs> You've trained me well, John. <laughs> so we can look at fire star data from across the mountains and get a sense for what those fire return intervals are for several hundred years, as well as we can also get some clues about the intensity of some of those fires from the, from the stars. And we can go back several thousand years when we start to look at soil charcoal samples, we take a, a profile out of the soil column and we can start to, just like an archeological re uh, review, go through those layers to see how far 
back in time, charcoal is appearing in that soil column. And we can also come across um, pollen grains and start to understand what types of vegetation were occurring in those, those time frames and are they fire adapted vegetation? And we found that. So that gives us a clue that, again, these mountains burned. And we'll take a quick peek at uh, Gaia and others fire return interval estimates. They used regression models to predict what they, they believed the fire return intervals were for the country from 1650 to 1850. So let's look at the Southern Acts. Holy guoli, holy guacamole, Batman. Uh, the mountains look <laughs> pretty orange and yellow and green with the exception of those high elevation cool sites. If you know your mountain ranges, those blue patches, you'll recognize them. They're the Smokies, the Balsams, the Black Mountains, Grandfather Mountain and Rhone. Those are our spruce fir, really cold climate sites. Everything else is fair game. We see fire return intervals anywhere from four to six years up to 20 to 25 and 30 years. That's important. <clears throat> we know that these mountains burned. So what changed at the end of the, or the turn of the century? We know that um, in the Eastern part of the state, the industrial Re revolution hit the state and really the country pretty hard. Things were exploding. And you can see in the Piedmont especially, the amount of urban centers that are growing and the railroads are exploding. But this also impacts the mountains. It doesn't look like it from this graphic, but remember I said travel to and through the mountains up until this time has been extremely restrictive. But with the arrival of the railroad, that changes everything. All of a sudden access into the mountains and through the mountains is wide open. And that brings with it the industrial commerce and the ability to move mass amounts of goods in and out of the mountain region. And it's in this time that with that access now available, uh, we start to, the country starts to assess what resources are available there, including the timber. And so we have a fantastic record from Ash and Pinchot um, in the 1897, where they assessed across the country, or excuse me, across the state, uh, the timber status as well as forest conditions for, to understand what those resources were like. So I wanna read you a couple quotes for a few significant mountain species, just to give us a glimpse as to what the landscape looked like. The first one is looking at pitch pine and table mountain pine. And he says, the area in which the table mountain and pitch pines are the important pine timber trees embraces the eastern and southern slopes of the Blue Ridge with outlying spurs from Georgia to Virginia. <clears throat> the broadleaf trees, which are associated with the pines, are chiefly the scarlet and chestnut oaks and the chestnut. There is no underwood and it is only occasionally that young trees are found and these are for the most part stump or stool shoots from trees the tops of which have been killed by the frequent fires which ravage these forests. Old trees, particularly oaks and chestnuts, show many defects from these fires, chiefly short and limby boles and hollows. So in 1897, pitch and table mountain pine forests were well documented to have frequent fire and the hardwoods, those oaks and chestnuts were well known to have dominant uh, fire scars. So what about the chestnuts, the icon of the mountains? What does he say there? Now remember, this is 1897. The blight hasn't come to the Bronx until 1905. So this is pre-blight damage. <clears throat> the chestnut is very common in the mountains of North Carolina at an elevation of 2,500 to 4,500 feet. Young plants are plentiful in moderately open woods and old fields. The young trees are decidedly light demanding and die quickly in deep shade. So pre-blight, the chestnut, even with land use changes and anthropogenic in, um, effects, the chestnut has been adapted to grow in open, high sunlight environments. That's important. Okay, so what about something like a mesophytic species? To be fair, right? What, is, what do they say about yellow poplar and red maple? He says about poplar, it reaches its best development in the tribes of, 
tributaries of the Ohio River and the lower slopes of the high mountains of Tennessee and North Carolina. It grows habitually in deep, rich, moist soil. And of red maple, he says, it occurs in swamps and low grounds from the mountains to the coast. Young trees are always common in damp woods and along streams. So even with all of this change in land use, and various civilizations over time altering and influencing the landscape, we're still seeing mesophytic species resigned to those damp, wet, cooler places, not on the ridgetop. That's where we see the pines and the ch uh, chestnuts and the oaks with frequent fire. So what changed? Well, the reason, one of the reasons they were doing this documentation was that the timber barons had exhausted the forest resources of the Northeast and the Great Lakes states by this point. And so they turned their sights on the South, including the mountains. And so they came and they logged every square inch that they could get into. And these are photos from uh, logging into um, practices on the slopes of the Black Mountains in the early 1900s. And with these logging practices, it was industrial scale. So it was not sustainable. There was no interest in regenerating the forest for future profit. It was had everything now. And with that came a lot of change to our forests and, and significant impact. Um, <clears throat> there were repeated uh, severe slash fires that started from the railroads as well as from the forestry camps that burned throughout the mountains and really had not only high intensity fires, but severe burn severity, um, which altered the seed banks, denuded the soils, and led to significant soil erosion issues all across the mountains. And so it's when these practices come to the south that we, in the states, start to recognize this is a problem. And so it's, it starts with uh, George Vanderbilt and Ash um, Gifford Pinchot, and later picked up by Carl Schenck, they create the Biltmore Forestry School. And this is a completely new concept for America, but the concept of sustainable forestry and, and land management is, is a new concept altogether. And so North Carolina forestry is kind of a big deal. It started here in the mountains of North Carolina on the outskirts of the Biltmore estate. And so, like I said, it started with Gifford Pinchot, and he was later tapped by Teddy Roosevelt uh, to become the first director of the U.S. Forest Service in 1905. And so we see a, a lot of change in a very short amount of time. We see not only the creation of the U.S. Forest Service, the Fish and Wildlife Service, the Park Service, federally, as well as the state of North Carolina, all within a matter of just a few years. And that's a, that indicates to us that as a country, we recognized that we were losing our natural resources and we were almost to the brink of not being able to come back and we needed to do something differently. We needed to understand how to manage our natural resources. <clears throat> Excuse me. But unfortunately, in the light of that, we also see the big blow up of 1910. Remember I said the US Forest Service was created in 1905. So this is just five years later. That's a really humbling experience to go through. We recognize that all of a sudden we're destroying everything basically. And we establish all of these government entities to, to help regulate ourselves and, and learn how to manage our land more effectively. And then this happens. And we have in, I think it's over 5 million acres burned that year. And in uh, the month of August in Montana, Idaho and Washington, over 3 million acres burned. This is a really hard pill to swallow for the country. And it's understandable that we kind of had a knee jerk reaction. There was a, there was a lot of debate um, back and forth really for, for years and, and several decades about what is the best policy going forward to manage our forests. Is it the woods burning tradition where we reduce our fuel loads by burning them? Or do we go the route of fire suppression and stop everything as quickly as possible and keep the footprint as small as possible? And 
we know how the story goes. Ultimately, fire, fire suppression wins out in policy. And so as a country, we stop fires as, as quickly as possible and we throw all of our resources into equipment and people power and learning how to suppress fire. And we get really good at it. We really do. And we go for decades without any form of natural disturbance, reducing those fuel loads and having the, the natural impact on these systems. And that's what lands us back here. So we, in the mountains, clear cut everything, erode the soils, alter the seed bank, and then go for decades with as little fire as possible. And so we know that we have inherited sites that look like this, that are so out of balance in their species composition, and we're losing the diversity in the understory. And like I said, our fuel loads are just through the roof. So that gets us to events like 2016. We know the landscapes we've inherited and we know that climate is changing and becoming more erratic and hard to predict. And we know that the wildland urban interface is increasing, especially in the mountains. So I'm really glad that after we hear from Tommy Cabe um, about fire use through the Cherokee Nation, um, we're gonna have some time with uh, Justin Query to kind of do a, the collective AAR. Um, we, we had time in, in amongst our own organizations to reflect on the events of 2016, but I think it's really good that we as the larger fire management community um, reflect on what happened and, and go over the lessons we've learned and, and celebrate the, the, the strides we've already made and, and kind of problem solve what is our way forward from here because we know what we've inherited and we know it's out of balance. So we need to start figuring out some ways uh, to make a difference and make these systems more resilient. And with that, I will say thank you to the Prescribed Fire Council Board for inviting me and giving me this opportunity to speak. And thanks to everybody else who managed to stay awake through my uh, history lecture. <laughs> Hopefully that was uh, somewhat engaging and uh, enlightening for you. And with that, I'll take any questions that you have. Sharon, thank you for that. That was fantastic as always. Um, you. We have a couple questions that came in through the chat and just um, two minutes to answer them. Um, <laughs> Joe Royce asked, what role do aspect and elevation play with the mosaic of vegetation and fire? And is there a record or map of logging railroads in the mountains? Ooh, two good questions. So the first one was aspect and elevation were the variables he was interested in? Yes. Okay, so uh, that's a good question. So generally the aspects that are the, the warmer, drier, and more fire adapted sites are the southern and western aspects on most of the mountains. And it depends on the elevation, but generally the higher in elevation you go, the cooler climate, and often, especially in the highest, cli uh, highest elevations, you get uh, up into the clouds. And so that's the cooler, wetter, spruce fir forest, northern hardwoods that often are sopped in in clouds and, and really did not burn frequently at all. It, if they saw fire, it was kind of on a century scale. Um, and the other question was logging railroads. There are some resources um, out there. I know that the um, Pack Square Library in Asheville has a tremendous amount of resources um, in, they have a North Carolina room there where you can dig through a lot of their logging history to the mountains. Um, so if you can either reach out to the librarian uh, virtually or go in person, they have a ton of information there. There are also some really interesting books that I'm trying to get my hands on that talk about specifically the logging companies and they have some maps of where their main lines went into the mountains. They don't. Uh, they didn't bother to map a lot of the the individual skid trails, as we would call them, of their railroads. Um, but they were everywhere. Everywhere they could get into. And in some places, it's shocking they got into. <laughs> Great. Thank you for that. 